Church, take your Bible and open it with me to the Gospel of Luke, the first chapter. We're going to read verse 26 through 33 as we take a portion of the snapshot of the events of Christmas, the coming of Christ, His incarnation. When you find it, stand with me if you would. I'm going to begin reading in verse 26, and when we get down to verse 29, we'll read that verse together, and then we'll read on through verse 33. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Let's read verse 29 together. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Verse 30, the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will, be, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and ever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Let's pray. Father, we come today and we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to open it and to allow your Holy Spirit to teach us, to speak to us, to encourage us, to strengthen us, to convict us. Father, to do all of those things that you know we need as you know, Father, and as you see fit. So, Father, today we pray for a receptivity to your word, that we would not just hear with our ear, but our heart and mind would uh, receive from you all that you have for us, to the end that you would be glorified in our midst, that you would be glorified in our lives, but, Father, that we would glorify and honor you with the way we live after being transformed to be changed to be more like Christ. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Thank you and be seated. Christmas is without doubt a great time of rejoicing and celebration for all of the obvious reasons that it's worthy of. But at the same time, today as in the first Christmas, there's a great somberness often at Christmas. Um, and sometimes it's in a family where this will be the first Christmas without a loved one. And that makes it a very somber time. Maybe it's a time facing hardships that in the normal time of the year, this hardship wouldn't be as big a deal. But right here at the Christmas time, to have to face this hardship seemingly makes it even a little harder. And it makes the season a little more somber. Well, such was the very spirit in the day when uh, Christ's birth was announced. It was a time when we sing... Uh, Silent night, the world lay in darkness. It's not talking about because the sun was down. It's talking about it was a, a, tar, a horribly dark time in the life of Israel. Rome had its foot on the throat of Israel, and all of the things of God and the people of God were in great distress. And there was a great wonder, has God forgotten us? There was a time when the Spirit of God was moving. If you look at the writings of many of that day of uh, the Jewish world, there was a great um, wondering as God was stirring their hearts for, for God to do something. And oftentimes we find ourselves in those places where uh, we don't know what's happening. And then sometimes when God shows up, instead of making it better, sometimes it seems like, wait a minute, uh, this is not exactly what I was looking for. And so as we think about all the things we can think about at Christmas, I really believe we could preach an entire year, 52 sermons on Christmas, and not get it all done. I really believe that. I'm not going to try it, but I believe it. Uh, it, it's, it's too profound an event. It's too profound a reality and a truth to plummet its depths. But we could talk about all of the divine, the incarnation, and what's called the hypostatic union. You couldn't have gone without the Christmas season without hearing that phrase. But uh, all of the theological import of the event. But in the midst of all of that, there are some human issues. There's human interaction that the coming of Christ impacted them. Uh, we're going to look today at the, at the troubling of Mary when, when God shows up. We're going to look next, next week when your dreams are diverted as uh, Joseph's whole world came crashing down when God showed up. But as we think about this season and we think about it, the rejoicing and the celebration of Christmas is not in the absence of somber times and what could be heart-wrenching situations, but it's in light of that as the Advent focus this week is on hope. That's the great, great Christian blessing is that of hope. Because without Christ, when those, we face those times and we face those troubles, there is nothing but just 
sentimental hope. But for the child of God, there is the eternal hope of God and His promises and that Christ's coming in every way embodies for us that in the most hopeless and greatest of hopeless situations, God has already come through. God has already manifest the love, the grace, the care that He has for His children. So that when we face these things, and as we come to Christmas to celebrate and rejoice, it doesn't mean it will not have any note of somber sadness in our voice, but it's in the part of that that even in that, that it makes the rejoicing more meaningful and more powerful. Sometimes God's work in our life brings anxiety and stress. Uh, you know, it, it uh, became aware to me one day that God had never obligated himself to explain to me ahead of time everything he's about to do. I don't know why he didn't, but he didn't do that. And uh, sometimes God is active, God is working, and we don't see around the corner of what's happening, and it can be confusing, it can be troubling. There's no saying that came out years ago that said, when you can't see his hand, trust his heart. What we do know about God, what we do know, what Christmas does shout, what the cross does shout out to us is, no matter what you're facing, you may be confused by it right now. You may be troubled by it at the moment. You may be even going through hurtful times and circumstances. But what the cross and the manger both say is that God has come down. God has come near. And we have every reason in the face of whatever trouble we're facing to know that it may be unclear right now but in time in time God will make everything clear and we'll see his glory and honor now I don't know that my granny Romans did a lot of quilting but she did some and I remember in her, her house was small and the best place she had for it was in her bedroom but over her bed there were hooks on the ceiling and there was a frame that hung up there and it was a quilting frame and they'd let it down when they were quilting. They'd quilt on it, but when Granny was ready, she'd put it back up out of the way. And we'd go. So I'd walk into Granny's bedroom, and I'd look, and I saw the bottom of the quilt, just threads dangling, just a mess. And I thought, well, whatever. But then Granny would get through, and they'd drop the frame, they'd drop the quilt on the bed. And I'm looking at it, and it'd be glorious, beautiful, pretty, and I can't help but think of that, how oftentimes we're looking at the bottom of the blanket, the bottom of the quilt. And we don't see what God is at work doing, but if we know what we know, we ought to be able to look at it with great hope and anticipation that though I can't see it now, I know there's a top and God's got it. And God's got it. Well, let's walk through our text. Uh, we want to talk about the setting, verse 26 and 27 gives us four details and and this is the thing I, I i thought about with all this is such simple stuff this is such everyday stuff it's such plain stuff but that's exactly in the times when god steps in we're going about our business they were going about theirs they were living their day they were doing their thing there was no neon flashing light in the sky the night before getting mary ready for an angelic visitation she was just doing her thing and god interrupts our days oftentimes in ways that we never anticipate. We see in the setting, first of all, it says in verse 26, it was in the sixth month. Well, the sixth month of what? Look back at verse 24. Now, after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself for five months. The angelic visitation to Mary is preceded by his angelic visitation to Elizabeth. The birth of John the Baptist is inextricably connected to the birth of Jesus. He's the forerunner who's going to be used of God to prepare Israel to be ready to receive their Messiah. So it's in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy that Gabriel shows up. The messenger, the messenger is announced to us as Gabriel. Now, uh, angelic uh, uh, popularity is... Uh, maybe it's, it's ebbing a little bit now, but man, for the la in the last 10, 15 years, everything angelic was huge. Billy Graham wrote his book, The Angels, in the late 70s. It's the first book known to go to, uh, to sell over a million copies and go to the first seller list in four months. It came out in October of the year, and by January, it hit a million. We're just intrigued with angels. 
We're told some interesting things about angels. We know they're ministering spirits of God, and they minister, they're involved in our lives in ways we don't even know. Paul the Apostle said to the church, act right when you come to church, for the angels say that when we come together to worship the Lord God, that the angels are drawn to this, that the angels are here. And I, I thought a while ago as we sang that song, hear the angels' voices, I thought, yeah, angels, and hear our voices too. We're here to praise. We're here to rejoice. We're here to give Him glory. And because we've experienced something they can never know. We have experienced the indwelling Spirit of God. They're in God's presence, but God is in us. Peter says they stand on their tiptoes and look over into that. They, they, that just blows their mind. And we act like it's, um, yeah, I'm saved. I got the Holy Spirit. Woo. But if we understood what that meant, and if we could somehow get the fullness of that, and who in the world would handle that? We're told of all the angels and activities we see in the Bible, and obviously the angels were a great part of the Christmas event, but we're given two angels' names in all the Bible. Gabriel here, the other is Michael. Uh, and, and out of all the things that happened, all the passages we could look at, there's a couple things we see. Uh, Gabriel announces, Michael acts. Gabriel declares, Michael defends. Gabriel informs, Michael inflicts. Gabriel explains God's plan. Michael executes God's plan. Those are the only two names we see out of the angelic host. But Gabriel comes, the announcing angel comes, and Mary encounters this angelic being and hears this unbelievable message from him. The place that it happens, we're told, is uh, the region of uh, Galilee and is to a city expressly Nazareth. I, 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 Nancy and I got to go to Israel, and I, I've, I've stood in Nazareth, and uh, there's a great Christian church there. got a great Christian school in Nazareth. But I couldn't help but stand there and think about it's, not, it's just not anything spectacular. It was the halfway point between the commercial towns of Ty and Sidon from Jerusalem. So being a halfway point, it was a overnight place, and it was a station place for military. And if you've ever been around military people, you understand what oftentimes bases uh, bring about in those areas and the kind of living that goes on, the debauchery and the sinfulness that can accompany that. It was also a place for merchants. It was close to the uh, port cities uh, before Amazon or Walmart had their distribution points. Nazareth was one. Uh, there, the, the merchants could set up, but it also brought in uh, all of those kind of elements. And we kind of get the, 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 the thought of the day about uh, Nazareth when Nathaniel is called and he's told by Andrew that uh, they found the Lord Jesus from Nazareth. Nathaniel says, can, there any, can anything good come out of Nazareth? So Nazareth wasn't a place that was on anybody's radar uh, as a great visitation. All the prophets talked about uh, Bethlehem being the birth of the Messiah, but Nazareth, it's off the beaten path. It's not on the, on the uh, place. So just a very common kind of place. Like most places. Certainly like our place. Just a place. Halfway between. Partially between here. People ask me, where you live, preacher? I say, well, I live in Athens. We're between Tyler and Dallas. That's how I say it. Just like I imagine folks would say from Nazareth. Yeah, we're from Nazareth. We're between Jerusalem and Tyre or Sidon. But it's in those places that don't have to have of themselves anything to make it special because it's what God does there that makes the difference. Well, we see the person. The Bible says that he comes, and twice the word virgin is used. We're going to talk a little bit more in a moment about that. If you've read some liberal that tries to say something about the word that's used here can also mean infant. That's just hogwash. This word is never, ever, I'm sorry, not infant, but maiden, as in a young woman. That word's never used that way. There's another Greek word for that, and it's always used for that. This is a word that speaks to the sexual purity and the virginity of a woman. It's used that way in the LXX, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, to translate Isaiah's statement that a virgin shall conceive and be born and give birth. And it's the same word that's used here. And we're going to see the importance of that in a minute. Now, I know for, for many, it's, it's the, uh, the point of scoffing and mocking. Uh, one of the things that Ben Franklin struggled with, by the way, a lot of things of the faith he wanted to embrace, but the deity of Christ was what he struggled with because the virgin birth is him. I mean, all of us know the, the logical issues with a pregnant virgin. 
But when Jesus said to his disciples, when nothing is impossible with God, we understand that what we needed was a miraculous Savior. In order for him to be able to be that, there had to be a miraculous arrival. And we're going to see why in just a minute. But not only are we told that she is a virgin, we're told that she's a spouse. And, and I know we have an engagement, but it's so much more than that in their culture. It was legally done. I mean, it was already binding. It was a, a covenant p- place before the actual covenant took place. And so this was, a, this was a serious matter. And so he comes to her, and he says to her in that context, uh, this um, unbelievable message that in itself both of those uh, points her virginity and her espousal were obviously going to be stressors in what was about to come and we're going to see he hadn't even given her the message yet she's already troubled we're going to see in a minute and he hadn't, he hadn't even given her the big news he's just there talking to her and that in itself freaks her out and rightly so let's talk about the salutation that's given in verses 28 through 30 let's talk about the wording of it it kind of breaks down into four parts there's their greeting. It's the word rejoice or hail. It's not exactly our word surprise, but it's kind of. It's a, it, it, it's, a, it's a word of excitement. It's a word of greeting. And it was certainly something that uh, while goodwill and uh, esteem is meant from it to her and to Mary, uh, it certainly would have been in every sense a surprise. But he also he says to her, thou art highly favored. They are highly favored. Now, again, you've got to remember with me the humility of Mary's life. Just a poor, what we would simply call, I guess, a blue-collar young woman in a blue-collar family bearing a blue-collar man who's a tradesman, who's a carpenter by trade. So just in every way. So to be told, to be told that, that you are highly favored... was unbelievable news now the the roman perversion of this uh has been well documented the idea that somehow mary uh not only did, did she receive grace but she became a dispenser there's where the perversion comes in all of us are going to see that's exactly what the exact translation means she was the recipient of god's favor she'd been a recipient of one of the greatest of god's favors to be the one that every every Jewish girl thought a new Messiah was coming, knew that Messiah would be born of a virgin. So every virgin girl of, of, of Israel would think, but in her humility and in her, her standings, probably never went into her mind that surely the virgin of one of, the, of one of the royal palace or somebody, but never to think of herself in those kind of terms. But it says, you have been highly favored. You have received that. And the, the church is a recipient of grace. And the Roman church per- perverts both of that and, and from recipient to dispenser. That somehow Mary, that's why they pray to Mary. is Because she can dispense grace. And they pray to Mary because what son can refuse his mama? I don't know any. Unless they're teenagers. Then they can refuse everybody. But the perversion of that idea that the church has received grace, but somehow the church dispenses grace. The church has no grace to dispense except what we received in the heart of every individual who make up the church. There's grace here this morning. When you're all gone, the only grace will be here is me if I'm in here. If nobody's here, there ain't no grace here. That God didn't put grace in the church for us to dispense it. Christ dispenses grace from the cross to whosoever will. Mary received grace, and it's not to take away from Mary. The perversion of that and, and all of that sometimes makes it hard in evangelical circles to talk about Mary because we know that great uh, perversion lies out there. But listen, it's the same thing that happened to me when I went to Israel the first time. I go to these places where God moved in the nation of Israel in amazing ways. If you've ever been there, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Every place you went, the Catholics would come in and lit a thousand candles. Now, I love my Catholic brethren. I do. I have some great Christian, some great godly friends some who are saved, some who are still seeking, but I have some great friends who are Catholic people. But they would come in and they burn candles. And I, my, the first day or two, I would look at that and I'd say, man, this would be great for one of all these candles. Kind of like in a worship service. We get distracted by stuff that really don't matter. But in just a couple of days, that guy got a hold of me and said, what are you doing, dummy? You're missing the point. The point is not what somebody's doing with it now. The point is what I did here years ago that I'm still touching lives with today. And I got over it. 
It'll unburn to me, and I don't care. It's going to change a bit what God has done. So with any confusion about Mary, we shouldn't take away from the fact of the honor that was bestowed upon her that she received the grace of God in a great way. They are highly favored. Then he says to her, the Lord be with thee. Or actually, the Lord is with thee. Well, in a time of troubling, in a time when we're struggling with what's going on and what's God going to do and what I'm facing, is God going to come through? How's it going to happen? What's all going to be? To be reminded, the Lord is with you. Now, there's two ways that's about to be true with Mary, right? It's about to be true physically. He's going to be with her, and she's going to be the host of that, that life. Uh, from conception, it is life, and she was going to be the host of that life. But more than that, that God was with her in the face of all that she was going to go through, that His sustaining grace, His sustaining presence is so powerful. The psalmist said it this way. He said, um, in thy presence is fullness of joy just to be in God's presence. I remember the childhood fears that would, be, that would be completely obliterated with just Daddy coming home. He worked 4 or 12, so oftentimes he didn't get home. To, he usually got home about 1 in the morning. So a lot of times there would be uh, childish fears, uh, bumps in the night or watching some scary on television and going to bed as a child and being fearful and having a fear and just hearing Daddy come in the back door. They just all went away. And I, I think about that, of what the difference it makes when the Spirit of God reminds me, Father's in the house. Father's here. What are we facing? What are we having to go with? Listen, the Lord is with thee, and God in your presence is fullness of joy. Just to know that was a great encouragement to Mary. He says to her, Blessed art thou among women, and all women and all men can say amen. Amen. Blessed is the, it's the, we get our English word eulogy from it, highly favored. It's the same word that Elizabeth gave when Mary goes to visit Elizabeth and she walks in and the baby, John the Baptist in Elizabeth's womb, jumps with joy. And Mary uses, um, Elizabeth uses the exact same word when she greets Mary and she says to her, Blessed art thou among women. But again, just a common young woman living her life, obviously a devout woman who loved God, obviously a spouse to a devout man who loved God, living in a world where God's arrival was desperately needed, but never thinking, never dreaming it had anything to do with her. You know, some, some, again, part of the perversion was that Mary was born in some immaculate conception as well. If that'd be true, don't you know that Mary would have been expecting when the angel showed up, she'd have said, well, it's about stinking time. I've been waiting. Where you been? But no, nobody, 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 nobody was more surprised and caught off guard than Mary was. And sometimes when God shows up the way he does it, it catches us off guard. I, I find myself sometimes ashamed of myself that I was so surprised. I should have been expecting God to do it, but I just didn't expect Him to do it like that. And all of a sudden, He does, and I find myself, wow, that's pretty special. And I'm thinking, well, what would you expect? Everything He does is special. That's who He is. Well, the wording, then let's look at the worry. It comes in uh, verse 29. It says, But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. The word's troubled. It's just what you would think. She was frightened. She was uneasy. She was disturbed by it. There's two, two things about it that would, that would do that for her. Just the sight of him. Uh, in Exodus, God said to Moses, No man will ever see God see me and live. And he's talking about the full, that a human man could not and, and hold the full glory of God without it killing him. But that was misapplied and often, and, and you guys like Jacob, Gideon, and Isaiah, when they saw a part of the manifestation, manifest glory of God, they were surprised they didn't die. So just the fact that she saw Gabriel and she saw this angelic being would have, would have brought some, some concern uh, as it was. But at the saying itself, 
because of her humility, because of who she was, just being greeted by a heavenly messenger, that God has taken notice of me. That God has taken notice of me. Now think about that. In our sin, God takes notice of us and He convicts us of our sin and He draws us to Himself saying, Hey, I, I see you, Tony. I love you. I see the lostness of your life and I want to save you from it. And He called me and He drew me to Himself. That God sees me and God sees you. Adrian Rogers, you say the same sun that warms the, the earth ripens the grape. That God sees you and He knows your great need. And all that was taking place that Christmas season was about God seeing you and your need. But as Mary encounters this, this glorious uh, greeting, it says she considers what manner of greeting it was to, to reason, to, to contemplate on it. She's going to do that again. The verse right after our last verse, Mary said, How can this be? I don't, I, I've never known a man. Uh, she, she's trying to figure this out. And isn't that, isn't that the first human response we always have? God shows up. God starts to do something in our life. And the first thing we do is we put it to the reason test. We put it to the logic test. We try to look at it and we try to reasonably, reasonably or logically understand and figure out what God's doing. And that always frustrates us because it never, seldom ever is able to work because what God is doing oftentimes our carnal minds are just not in tune with and we're not ready to, we're not ready to get that and to receive that and it says she ponders on that she thinks on that how in the world God what are you doing have you ever said that to God God what are you doing Lord I have well, what are you doing I don't get this I don't understand this you're, you're doing something, you're, you're, you're moving, you're directing, you're, you're, you're redirecting, and God, I don't get it, I don't understand it. And I hear God sometimes say, well, is that a requirement for you to obey me? Do you have to understand ahead of time what I'm doing, or are you going to trust me and walk by faith and do what I'm saying? And that's the great struggle in it. We want to we put everything to the human reasoning test. That's why so many people struggle with the virgin birth. That's not logical. No, nobody ever said it was logical, but it's biblical and it's historical. Live with it. Live with it. God has never required himself, he's never obligated himself to explain to us logically what he's doing. Now, our faith is logical because what we know logically should conclude for us, no matter what God's doing, I can trust him with it. That's logical. That's reasonable. What else does God have to do to show me or convince you that he's trustworthy and no matter what he's doing, it may seem odd, difficult, troubling, hard, scary at the moment, but everything we know about God says it's reasonable for me to trust you. You never fail me. You've never failed to come through. You always, always. So it's logical and reasonable to trust God even when we can't logically or reasonably explain what he's doing at the moment. And she reasoned about that. She was worried about it, troubled by it. Again, showing her humanity. But then the angel gives her a wonderful word, verse 30. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Do not be afraid. You have found favor with God. To hear God say to our hearts, when we're facing times of, of hardship and trouble and struggle, when we're facing times of grief and loss and hurt, to hear God say, I know it's a part of the human condition to feel those things. But listen now, fear not. Like Paul said to the church at Thessalonica, we sorrow, but not as those who have no hope. It's human. It's, it's, it's our humanity that would cause us to stress and to be anxious. But those, those seasons should be short-lived because what the, our logical mind says is perplexing and confusing and hurtful and painful ought to quickly be doused and put away, though, with the faith that God's grace, God's mercy, God's love has forever buoyed me and will forever buoy me through this. And no matter what I'm dealing with, I can handle it. It's one of my favorite stories. I don't know how long ago I heard it. But it was about a young preacher. I think we really got it. I was a young preacher when I read it. A young preacher at his first church, and a lady who had been a matriarch of the church, just a great saint of God, was on her last few hours. 
and he had gone to her bedside to pray with her. He'd not been pastor there very long, and he goes in and he 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 kneels down and he, and he sits by her and he leans over and he kind of says to her ear, um, "Sister, are you sinking?" In a tactful way, trying to ask her, "Do you feel like this is unto death?" going to try to encourage her in those moments and she didn't say a word he thought well she's hard of hearing so he said a little louder sister are you sinking and no response so one more time sister are you sinking and she looks at him and she said with the great faith and wisdom of her age sinking how can i sink when i'm standing on a rock <laughs> see everything about our circumstances often shout to us like the waves coming over Peter's head. You're going down. It's not going to happen this time. God's not going to come through. It's going to, you're going to break. You're going to be destroyed. You're going to be crushed. And those lying circumstances snarl and shout and growl in our face and in our logic and in our reason. We seem to buy in and believe, oh, maybe, maybe that's right. Maybe this time. Maybe he's not. Maybe I was really going to have. But our circumstances are liars. How many times have you worried you were going under and you're just, look here, here you still are? Why? Because your circumstances lied. They lie. But we come back and we say, no, I can, I can know that I can know that God is going to see me through this. Do not be afraid, Mary. Don't be afraid. She says, you have found favor with God. It's, the word is translated grace over 130 times in our New Testament. You've been favored. You've been graced. To have favor of God is to be, to be graced, have the grace of God, the favor of God. I love that word favor. I love it because that means things are always in my favor because I've got the favor of God. We, we used the phrase years ago in, in San Antonio. We called it the year of the fog. <laughs> we were going to walk in the fog. I, I, I know you're looking at me like, oh, that don't sound like a great thing, preacher. And it wasn't, but it, when you understand, we, fog stood for favor of God. We're living in the favor of God, and, and we do. Sometimes the fog <laughs> comes in, rolls in with our circumstances, but it's great to be reminded in those times when we don't see, wait a minute, the favor of God is still in my life, still on my life. Now, hey, if I've disobeyed God and I'm being disciplined, that hurts. Discipline's going to hurt. But even that I know is in the favor and grace of God, that I'm being, I'm being disciplined as a child. He's not going to crush and destroy. He's going he's to lovingly discipline me. But even after that, there's renewal and there's restoration and there's life and there's going. So no matter what the purpose of the circumstance, no matter what brought it on, that there is still favor of God, the grace of God on our life. And Mary was just reminded that this is a grace, unmerited favor, grace, unmerited, undeserved. In no way, nobody would look at Mary's life and say, Mary, you deserve this anymore. And anybody would look at our life and say, you deserve Christ and his death on Calvary. You deserve to be forgiven of your sin. You deserve for God to hear your prayer of repentance and confession and to receive you into his family we nobody we don't deserve there's nothing about us that deserves that that's why it's grace it's grace for by grace are you saved through faith the gift of god not of works that any man should boast the grace of god and mary is reminded that she don't have to fear because you don't have to fear the grace and goodness of god you don't have to fear what god is doing in and through your life well, in verse 31 through 33, we get the specifics. She's told, first of all, about his conception. In verse 31, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Well, first of all, he mentions this conception. Uh, behold, pay attention. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, this is important news I'm about to give you. You shall conceive in your womb. It's another reference. It's a different way of saying conceive than normally would be discussed in a cohabitation biological situation that she's going to conceive in her womb. It's going to be something that God does miraculously in her, not some pagan sense of some kind of a sexual thing. It's not, it's, it's not that at all. This is a miraculous creative act of God. When there was nothing, God spoke, and everything that is came into existence. God didn't take what was there and build it. There was nothing to build with. God spoke, and the material universe came into existence. To think that it would be difficult for God to speak, that the Holy Spirit would come upon her, and the result would be a human life conceived in the womb of the virgin. That Christ would be willing for that. 
for that to happen. You see, you have to understand all of redemption leans against that wall of his deity. If Christ was not divine, he was a man with a sinful nature, just like every other man. And even if he somehow conquered his sin nature and lived perfect uh, obedience to God, he'd have no grace to give. He would just be an example of what we're not. And we'd still be hopelessly lost in our sin and separated forever uh, from God because sin separates us from God's holiness. But because he was the God-man, because he was God in the flesh, he came not with just obedience of his own, but he came with grace to bestow and to give. He came as one of us to redeem us from our sin. The curse affected uh, the blood, and Christ needed to be the pure Son of God to bring forth the Son. Why? Because by one man came sin, and by sin came death. There's a little picture of this in the story of Israel. It's repeated in John chapter 3. When Israel began to gripe and murmur and complain, and God sent serpents in and bit them, and they were dying, they go to Moses. Moses goes to God and says, Okay, put a brass serpent on the pole, and when they look at it, they'll live. <laughs> now, if you've been bit with a serpent, and you go running looking for medical treatment, they say, Oh, don't worry, just go over and look on that serpent, and you'll live. My response might have been, Your mama, let's do a little better. Uh, I ain't got much time. Let's do something. Can we got a better idea? Got another idea better than that? But you see, God put on a pole what caused the problem. Different from what caused the problem, but it was what caused the problem. And they looked to it, and by faith, their look brought life and healing and holiness. By one man came sin, and by sin came death. And so God put a man, the God man, on the cross that we could look and live in him. So every aspect of the details are vitally important and spot on to God's plan and what God is about and what God is doing. He says, His calling, you shall call His name Jesus. And Jesus simply means Jehovah is salvation. Jehovah saves. Salvation It's just shortened down to Jesus. It means salvation. But you see, that, that name... Uh, said everything about the ministry that Christ was going to have. You think about Christmas and we think about presents being given and, and a lot of thought maybe go in. Some, some pre presents don't get a lot of thought. It's just here, get them something. You know, they got me something, I got to give them something. Okay. What, what aisle are the chocolate covered cherries on? That was my go to gift. What were the chocolate? Because if they didn't like them, I loved them and I'd eat them if they didn't want them. <laughs> but think about it. Christ comes to meet the greatest need, the need of our sin, to meet the greatest need of our life. But it's not only is it the greatest need, it was for the greatest number. Everybody needed. Everybody needs Him. Universal. Every person on the planet needs that one gift. Now, every other needs might, might diverge off into all kinds of different paths, but there is one universal need of every boy, girl, man, woman and it's the need for our sin to be atoned and taken off of our life and God's forgiveness and grace placed in its stead and Christ came to meet the greatest need and he came to meet it to the greatest number his character he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest he shall be great he shall be great it's talking about his character. It's talking about his holiness. It's talking about his person. The word great in the Greek is the word megas. We get mega from it. Megaseo means big, grand, great. That word is used here in the Bible, and it's used of Jesus in these ways. He shall be called great, great in his holiness. He brings a great salvation. He's the great high priest. He's the great shepherd of the sheep. He's the Lord of lords and king of kings. And it says he's the son of the highest. So again, a mention of his deity and his humanity together. We're going to talk about that more later on. Not an ordinary child, but the eternal Son of God who came to save sinners. The last statement we have is his crown, verse 32b and 33. It says, And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and this will, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Even in the mention of his coming, his coming is connected to the nation he came to be Messiah of. 
I just saw something a few weeks ago how there was a great celebration in Israel and how all these young Jewish people were uh, expecting and anticipating Messiah. And I want to thank 2,000 years too late, buddy. Everything about Messiah that was prophesied has been fulfilled in Christ. Everything Messiah was to be, he was. And one of the things he was to be was of the throne of David. And you see in the genealogies of the Gospels that he was qualified from both Joseph and Mary's lineage of the lineage of David to be the crown or to wear the crown of Israel and to be the Messiah of Israel. He fulfills the promise of David to Jacob, the house of Jacob forever. And there had been a few rulers who had ruled a little bit of time. Uzziah, 52 years. Manasseh, 55 years. But we're told that Christ is going to reign forever. And we know that millennial reign at the end of the Great Tribulation, which is a, an Israeli event, after the church is raptured away, God turns again to deal with the nation of Israel. He's not through with Israel yet. God's not finished with Israel. He's still going to have the most glorious, the most glorious position of any nation ever spawned on the earth. They, through them came Messiah, and Messiah is going to rule and reign over them. He is going to be their governor. He's going to be their prince, their king for a thousand years. And after that, he's going to rule all eternity of all mankind. But God is not through yet with the nation of Israel. And there's a promises yet to be fulfilled that are going to be fulfilled completely and fully in the messianic kingdom of Christ's literal reign on the earth for a thousand years. We all face unplanned situations we all know circumstances can turn on a dime we all can find ourselves crawling out to God and asking God to do something only to be woefully surprised in the way he does it but to me that's the great hope that we see Christmas embodying and offering it's the hard days that we face that speak the most to us. I remember my failures far more than I remember my successes. And it's in my failures I need to hear, fear not. Grace, favor of God is with you. Trust me. Cling to me. Come to me. Let me do in you and through you everything that my grace and love and mercy is going to do. So as we have this, this, this moment right now to deal with what we're facing at the moment, but also to prepare us to face whatever we're going to face in the days to come, to nail down completely and surely what it means that when God shows up, I don't have to fear. I don't have to be troubled. I don't have to be ang anxious over it. I can trust God with it. And the, the manger reminds me of that, and the cross proclaims it forever, that I can trust God with it. What are you facing today that needs faith and hope? You can only find it in Him. You can only find it in Him. But He came to you so that we could come to Him and receive it. Let's pray, and then we'll respond. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the hope, the eternal hope that lives in the Lord Jesus. He's called our blessed hope in, in every way that He is. Father, I pray right now as You've been speaking to our hearts, as You've been encouraging us and showing us, even in our failures, even in our anxiety, even in our struggles, and even in our stress, that God, You are worthy of our trust and our faith and our hope could never be more rightly placed than we've placed it in you. So Father, right now I pray for the heart that's hurting. I pray for the life that's troubled. I pray for the one that's seeking, wanting to know the real meaning and is there any peace in life? Is there any joy? Is there any hope for me? And the answer from the cross says yes, eternally yes, if you'll come to Christ and repent of your sin, make Him Savior and Lord of who you are, He will be all in all in you and to you and even through you. So, Father, I pray for the one that's lost today to be drawn and be saved. I pray for the saved to be built up and strengthened and encouraged. Father, as you speak to our hearts, may we obey in Jesus' name. Our deacons are here to pray with you, to pray for you. Would you stand as the praise team leads us in an encouraging thought to just come to him and let him have his way. You come.